Paperback Rocker, episode 85. Hey, this is Matt Severson, the Paperback Rocker, and I'm broadcasting from my 6 by 9 foot cinder block shack in the desert of northern Mexico, southern Texas. Welcome and thanks for checking out my show. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your old friend Matt, the paperback rocker, back again as I adjust my microphone placement with another episode of my podcast, The Little Bitty Paperback Rocker Show, where you can hear me read now in its current iteration. Its prior iteration was as an a, a monologue-based show in which I played music and I had um, scripts and everything I did, and it was kind of a less shoot from the hip. And it also, uh, in a secondary or a subset iteration of that iteration, I did some interviews with some interesting people from both from my personal life and from uh, the professional worlds of um, music video production and things like that and uh, my mom Linda Severson has a real good episode about her book uh, Wildflowers and Broken Gods that I had a small part in uh, getting to market and you can find her book on Amazon drop me a line at paperbackrocker at live.com and I'll tell you about anything that my family sells that you can buy and the next thing we're going to do after that is uh, we're going to get back into this Blue Whiskey novel. And uh, we would be on page uh, 164. And we're on volume 29. And we're on episode 85 as we slither ever closer in a snail-like fashion to the big episode 100 where I will be showered in gifts from my many listeners from all over the world, and I'm already smiling thinking about it. The popsicles will be had and everything. It'll be a lot of fun. That will be episode 100. My mailing address can be gotten by dropping me a line at paperbackrocker at live.com. Allow... Allow some time for your packages to get here, so uh, you might want to go ahead and get in touch with me on that. Okay. Um, Stanton has just played the Eternal Flame in a a little cafe slash coffee shop slash slash speakeasy in his first show in Greenwich Village. And um, he brought the house down by by announcing that He had just gotten a Holocaust-style tattoo in which, uh, in honor of the death date of Hitler. And that was to match the old man Chaim's tattoo from the uh, concentration camp Auschwitz. And uh, Ben Benjamin, the son of Chaim, also got the tattoo matching Stanton. Okay, so just to be clear, the old man has the real Auschwitz tattoo with with um, some number on it, and the uh, the two younger guys have the Hitler death date tattoo in, in numbers instead of the Auschwitz identification numbers. Okay, and he has just been asked by one of the people to take a break. Because they want to call and get some more people to come see him. Okay. And he's doing that. I walked like a zombie to the front door and went outside to get a fresh of breath air, as Johnny Cash had put it. I sat down on the sidewalk with my back against the building and my legs extended in front of me. Just like I used to when waiting for the thirsty possum to open. 
A moment later, Ben and his father appeared standing over me. Ben said, Stanton, that was amazing. The old man reached his left hand down to me. I extended my left up to him, and he locked onto it with surprising strength. He bent forward and placed his right hand on the bandage over my tattoo. Our eyes locked, and I expected him to say something, but his lips were pursed tightly. His eyes said it all, sadness, happiness, and a million other bittersweet things. He had just exited his own tunnel, the tunnel from oppression to freedom. Ben said, I'm taking Papa home, but I'll be back. He repeated, Stanton, that was amazing. I learned another important thing during my short first set at the coffee shop. It was the first time I had performed a song in that manner, extending it and speaking to the audience while I strummed the guitar. I had never seen another folk singer perform at that point. I didn't know this was a common tactic employed by people like Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan. I guess I stumbled upon the technique just like they must have. I rose from the sidewalk and turned to look in the front window to see if I should go back in. Three people were waiting to use the payphone, and the man who asked me to take a break had the receiver to his ear. He saw me and smiled and gave me a thumbs up with his free hand. Then he waved at me not to come back in yet. As I sip my espresso. I smiled and sat back down for a bit, then went for a walk around the block. As I turned the corner, I ran into Ben on his way back. Stanton, I can't thank you enough for what you did for my father. It was nothing. There were only ten or eleven people there. He's the survivor. Jews like my father never want to be in the spotlight, Ben said. That's why he never talks about the war. He doesn't need the world's approval. Ten people were enough. He couldn't stop raving about how good you were. Tears welled in my eyes, and I couldn't speak for a moment. I was feeling everything very deeply after the blue whiskey. It was probably responsible for my first foray into live improv- improvisation, too. Finally, I said, Ben, that's why I'm doing this. It's not about money. It's about what music can do. It touches lives. You better make it about money or we'll both starve. We? You need a manager and I need a purpose in life. He said, aren't you supposed to be playing at the, aren't you supposed to be playing at the coffee shop? Intermissions running longer than expected, I said. I have a feeling Act Two will be better attended. Good, Ben said. You're thinking about money again, aren't you? Just so you don't have to. I am your manager, or am I your manager or not? Well, you do have the right attitude about making a profit, but if you apply it to me, I won't make a dime. We're soldiers in the same foxhole, Stanton. I make money when you make money. Nothing could have hit home better than that. Okay, I said, and we stopped and faced each other and shook hands. Don't say anything else, Ben. I'm an artist. Talking about money makes me feel dirty. We walked around the block, and I mentally prepared myself to play the rest of the show. Back at the coffee shop, things were bustling. Ben and I had to wait in line to get back in. The burned-in smell of java was usurped by the hoppy nose of beer. The place was packed, and more streamed in all the time. By appearance, they were almost all Jews. Ben said, let me introduce you. Man, I wish I had a PA, I said. If all these people want to talk, nobody will hear me. I'll see what I can do. Are you ready? I'm ready. By now, it was standing room only. Ben waved his hands over his head and yelled, Attention, everyone! Can I have your attention, please? The crowd hushed a bit, but most of the people couldn't see Ben, who was not a tall man. There was a built-in bench along the wall, so he stepped up on it. The crowd gave him their attention. My, how word travels through our community! He said with a smile. I feel like I'm at synagogue. There was much laughter. Hello, Theo, Ben said with a little wave. Isaac, welcome. Ben took in the scene for a moment, 
scanning the crowd and recognizing faces. His eyes flashed each time he found a friend, and his smile seemed to grow wider each time. I can't greet all of you individually, he said, but I see many, many friends have come here tonight. I'm sure they are surprised to see me standing up here on this bench, but I am happy to announce that Stanton Wheelhouse III and I have come to an agreement, and I will be managing him him henceforth. Polite applause rose, muffled by woolen felt coats and heavy beards. It gives me distinct pleasure to introduce a young man who is a most remarkable musician. I give you Stanton Wheelhouse the Third. He forgot to ask the crowd to be silent during my performance. Ben reached down to me and helped me up onto the bench before he hopped down. Show the tattoo. Yes, show the tattoo. Hello, everyone. My name's Stanton Wilhouse the Third. There was no applause, just stern looks. Show the tattoo, please, Mr. Stanton, a man said in a thick European accent. I shrugged and thought, give the people what they want. I slung the guitar to my back. I rolled down, I rolled the arm of my plum colored blouse up and slowly peeled back the bandage. The place was absolutely silent, as if I was performing a delicate medical procedure. I revealed my artwork and all hell broke loose. It was just a tattoo on a goy's arm, but you would have thought I announced the death of Hitler himself. They were bouncing off the walls, and these were not teeny boppers. Most of them had to be 50 and 60 years old. I gave them a good three minutes to finish celebrating. Three minutes is a long time in some situations. They were all talking to each other and were pretty much satisfied with the evening, whether I played or not. I began playing my acoustic as hard and loud as possible. A good, fat, western body like mine can generate some decibels, so it got their attention. I stopped abruptly. Now that I have your attention, I'm Stanton Wilhouse III, and I come to you from Oxford, Mississippi, by way of New Orleans. I need to ask a favor. Please refrain from talking while I play, for I do not have the luxury of amplification. Excuse me. I'll perform for 30 minutes, then take a break. If you want to leave after that, you will have seen the goy with the tattoo. As written, it might, not be, it might be interpreted that I delivered my words with ego or sarcasm, but that was not the case. I was elated by all that had transpired that evening, and it was just getting started. I spoke as a confident artist. I demanded their attention and insisted they listen to me without distraction. I launched into my set, but I did not knock the songs down like dominoes, like back on Bourbon Street. I relaxed and let the music breathe. I gave myself license to improvise, both instrumentally and vocally. It was the greatest thing I ever did for myself as a musician and performer because it allowed every gig from then on to be of the moment. I was not a jukebox playing songs the same way every time, whether you put in a dime or a dollar. I was me, Stan Wilhouse III, and I would not fit inside a Wurlitzer. I barely fit into Madison Square Garden after a while, but that's getting ahead of myself again. I ended my set with another emotional performance of Eternal Flame and received a standing ovation from a coffee house full of Jews, which was another first. It felt amazing. Most of them left at the break, but it was now getting late, and as I said, they were an older crowd. I played an hour longer, and people from the street trickled in and out. By the end of the night... My guitar case held a couple hundred dollars. I offered a cut to Ben, but he refused, as he always would in the future, telling me he only wanted his 20% cut of the house and or the door, depending on the contractual agreement with the venue. I treated him to a late-night breakfast paid for with my tips, a ritual we would repeat countless times over the years. Reading my exploits to this point, you might come to the conclusion that everything came easy for me. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every show was preceded with almost debilitating bouts of nerves, which thankfully evaporated in the first minutes of the first song. Also, I'm telling my story in retrospect. 
I did win those crowds over at the Clam Shack in Newport News and at the coffee shop that night, but nothing was ever guaranteed. There were bad nights, but I rinsed them from my memory, and they have no place in my autobiography. Over the next six months, I played at least five nights a week in coffee houses, dive bars, and bookstores. I played on the street. I played at Grand Central Station. I played in the subway. There was one place I did not play, though, the folk clubs of Greenwich Village. A couple paragraphs ago, you were thinking things were too easy for me. I guess they were until I got blackballed. Okay, I better stop there. That is page 169, and this book, Blue Whiskey, is, lit, um, no exaggeration, one of the most beautiful books you'll ever see, self-published or uh, otherwise, and it is available from me by contacting me at paperbackrockerlive.com. I'll be happy to send you a signed copy to anywhere in the United States, and it is also available via the... Uh, Retail giant Amazon. And uh, if you need help finding it, let me know. Once again, also check out my mom's book, Linda Severson's Wildflowers and Broken Gods, a memoir of a year in a remote little Greek village where my dad was a radio operator broadcasting from a small shack in the middle of nowhere. Think about it. I'll see you next time. Have a good one. The Paperback Rocker has signed off.